Hello, I'm Lauren Schoenberg. I'm the senior scholar at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, and this presentation is going to show the intersection between composed music and improvised music. Now, I'm going to be talking about two giants, Johann Sebastian Bach and Coleman Hawkins, and how somehow their musics are intertwined. But before we talk, before we start explaining and do the history and all that fascinating stuff, why don't we actually listen to Coleman Hawkins play the saxophone and Pablo Casals play the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. And I want you to keep one thing in mind as we do that. And it's just this saying, which is the best improvised music sounds composed and the best composed music sounds improvised. Now, I have to say, we all know that there's no such thing as the best anything. But just to make an argument, to get the conversation going, it makes the point that when you hear classical music or you hear jazz, and these are outmoded terms that have a lot of confusion in and about them, I'm going to use them because I think we all understand the general parameters of those terms. Classical music is written and then interpreted. Jazz music, for the great part, is created in front of you as a theme and variations. When I hear a great classical pianist play Bach, or any instrument play Bach. If I close my eyes and listen, I kind of experience it like the music is being created right in front of me. It's being improvised, because the great artist who's interpreting Bach's music brings that spirit to it. And in the same sense, when I hear a great jazz improviser do theme and variations right in front of me as I'm experiencing it, I listen to it and it seems to have the same undergirding structure, form, that great composition has. Sometimes I can even tell where it's going to go, even though it's being made up right in front of me. So we're going to approach this from the point of view that these two things, improvisation and composition, come together in the greatest art. So, as mentioned, we're going to watch Pablo Casals play a Bach piece, a solo suite, an excerpt from it. And as you listen to it, I'd like you to think that he's just sitting there with his cello and he's just kind of just like fooling around improvising. It sounds like that to me. And then we're going to hear Coleman Hawkins play his tenor saxophone. And even though he's doing it, making it up as they were making this little film, to think about it, if you were to hear it played, let's say, a la Bach at the piano, it has the same form and structure. So, as I said, enough talk. Let's actually hear some music. <laughs> 
that something? I mean, both these things were recorded in the late 1950s, 1960s. And later on, we're going to delve into great detail about exactly what these connections are. Basically, three chords underlie virtually everything that we know in popular music, in virtually all of what we call classical music up until a certain point uh, in the early 20th century. And I'd like to demonstrate for you exactly what I'm talking about because it'll show us the specific relationship between the music of Johann Sebastian Bach and Coleman Hawkins, and Coleman Hawkins as the entryway into virtually all jazz improvisation. Now, the three chords that I'm talking about, and I don't want to get too technical here, trust me, anyone who's listening to this or watching this knows these sounds. You know them. You may not know what the name of it is, <laughs> of them are, but you know it because you've heard it since the first time that you ever heard music. The three chords are... tonic, the dominant, and the subdominant. That's what musicians call them. You don't need to worry about that. Now, what Bach showed, and this was, you know, back many hundreds of years ago, right? Okay, back in the early 18th century, which would mean, you know, the years around 1700. What he showed was that you can go from one of those chords to another chord. Instead of just going bing bong, you, there are 15 different little highways around those chords. I'll demonstrate. I mixed up all different kinds of eras in that particular demonstration. But that showed just the basic way that you can embellish those sounds. Now, for every little embellishment I did there, there are 15 embellishments on those embellishments. So when you listen to the music of Bach, like when we just heard Pablo Casals, and you heard all those little note changes, one note here, one note there, that's what I'm talking about, the other little tributaries of the basic river of these chords. And simply put, what Coleman Hawkins showed was that in jazz you could take the exact same approach and dissect what would seem to be one chord, one sound, and find within it all these other pathways. And it's from that that we get the music of Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and John Coltrane and all the other great innovators of jazz music. So I hope that that makes the basic concept here uh, kind of audible. Now, the next thing that we're going to listen to will be one of the great jazz ensembles taking full on the legacy of Bach. And trust me, that's a heck of a legacy to take on because you're competing with the master composer. The album was called Blues on Bach. The musical director and composer was John Lewis. And he put together this piece of music in tribute to Bach, taking Bach through his own jazz way. I want you to listen to it and compare it in your mind to what we have already heard from Coleman Hawkins and Pablo Casals. Mm -hmm. 
Wasn't that wonderful? Jesu joy of man's desiring, taken by John Lewis and jazzified. And by jazzified, I mean brought into, well, that's music from the 20th century, and with the blues influence and uh, the African-American influence and the German Bach influence. And in fact, we don't even need to be tracing all that, just say the human experience. And that's one of the great things about the music of Johann Sebastian Bach and Coleman Hawkins and anyone else that you want to discuss uh, in this particular exposition, which is that great art tends to focus in and expose the essential humanity of human beings. And it doesn't make a difference whether it's a painting from 500 years ago that was done in Italy, whether it was a piece of what we call African art, whether it was something from, name the continents, name all the people on the earth, you will find these pieces of music, these pictures, these stories, that when you boil them all down to the essentials, they talk about basic things that all human beings share. So even though we're talking here about jazz and Bach and this century and these people, I'd like you to think about it possibly from an even more macro perspective of just trying not to focus in on what makes all these sounds and all these influences different, but what unites them. And there's something in what Johann Sebastian Bach did to harmony and to chords uh, that has traveled all around the world. Now, we heard a great jazz ensemble interpret the music of Bach in their own way. Now, there was a very interesting pianist by the name of Frederick Goulda. I'm happy to share this next so selection with you. He spent a lot of time improvising, doing jazz, doing uh, two piano concerts with people like Herbie Hancock you can find on various social media, a lot of these wonderful videos. But we're going to show Goulda here playing a piece on the piano that Bach wrote, a very famous one. And I want you to imagine that he's improvising it because this is actually is a guy who could improvise, improvise very, very well, as could Bach. And when we, after we listen to Frederick Goulda, I want to give you a little bit of a background on Bach that might surprise you. So this is Frederick Goulda. Sebastian Bach, chromatische Fantasie und Flugen. 
Frederick Gorba playing one of Bach's great chromatic fantasies and fugues. We heard just a, an excerpt from it. I apologize for that, but this talk would be much too long if we listened to all these pieces in their entirety. Now, the fascinating thing about Frederick Gould was he was a musician who could improvise famously with Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea and all kinds of great jazz players, compose, play the music, and yet when I heard him play, it sounded improvised, something that we've talked about. Now, I happen to listen to music with my eyes closed, not when I'm driving my car, but when I have the opportunity, because sometimes I find that the visual element distracts me from actually the aural element. That's how it is for me. I'm looking at the face they're making or the, the feet or the piano or the band or something like that. And I really like to listen to music just as pure sound. And if you do that and forget that you're watching a classical pianist play or forget that you're seeing a jazz band with all the things that go on a, on a jazz bandstand and just listen to the sounds and try and intuit what's happening. A lot of these barriers that have to do with the visual and with the social and the cultural tend to disappear. Let me talk just for a moment about Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach now known as, you know, the, the bedrock of so much music, uh, was not greatly known as a composer during his lifetime. And in the over 100 years after he died, uh, was thought of as someone who wrote music for study. In other words, you would play the Bach things to learn how to play the organ, to play the harpsichord, to play the clavier, and eventually the piano, or his great uh, works for, for orchestra, small orchestras, and or religious music. But he was not known uh, as one of the great composers of music just to listen to. During his lifetime, he was known as a choral director, as a teacher, and as an incredible organist. And he was famous, in fact, he was famous, he was infamous at the beginning of his career for jazzing it up. In other words, people would come to the church to hear something and there was a little moment where Bach at the organ was supposed to play this hymn or this piece of music that they were waiting for. And he would, what they called in those days, prelude. And there are many, many written examples of people complaining he's preluding too much, which would mean that he was sitting at the organ and what we would call playing jazz which is just extemporizing interesting rhythms, uh, going on and on on one idea, then coming over to another idea, and then eventually getting to the point where it was time to cue everybody to come in. And it wasn't until the early 19th century when the composer Mendelssohn started making the point that, well, Bach's music uh, was not just academic. It was not, it was not just to learn to, uh, how to finger on the keyboard but there was great music in and of itself. And in the same way, a lot of jazz musicians uh, really have not gotten the due that they have as composers. Because, for instance, when Brahms writes a variation on the music of Bach, the composer credit goes to Brahms. In other words, uh, you know, Brahms' uh, variations on a theme by, by, uh, by uh, Schubert or Schumann. Composer, Brahms. In the jazz world, when someone like Charlie Parker or John Coltrane or Louis Armstrong or whomever does their version, their improvisations, their variations on a work by George Gershwin, the composer credit still goes to George Gershwin, where, as far as I'm concerned, Charlie Parker's record of Embraceable You should be variations on Embraceable You by Charlie Parker. And same with Coleman Hawkins. Now, in the early 1960s, Bach and jazz started to come together in the commercial marketplace. And this is where a lot of jazz folks really got introduced to the wonders of Bach's music and its uh, complexity, and vice versa. Uh, a lot of folks in the classical world began to realize that Bach was more than just what was written on the page, that you could take it and make of it whatever you wanted. This is the Swingle Singers, and uh, here it is. Oh, 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 oh. 
that was the Swingle Singers. And it was really interesting in the 1960s there that as that music gained in commercial popularity, that people were getting a strong dose of Bach. And as I mentioned before, for many years after his death, Bach was thought to be the guy whose compositions were only for students, were only how to learn to play an instrument, how to finger the keyboard, or how to write counterpoint. And ultimately, his music just became beloved for what it was. It's fun sometimes just to think, like, could you imagine uh, Bach, um, uh, whether he could have conceived of the fact that his music would become uh, pop music in the 1960s? But that's within the realm of the hypothetical. And the hypothetical is something a little dangerous to get into because if we go too far into it, then we get into what would happen if Thomas Edison's father hadn't met his mother, and then this would have been very hard to put together today. So enough with the hypotheticals. In the 1970s, two brilliant jazz saxophone players made a recording of what a lot of musicians had been doing up in their hotel room or at home uh, practicing, which is to take some of Bach's music written for two instruments and play it. Now, it was originally meant to be played uh, on a keyboard instrument, left hand and right hand. Well, the saxophonist Lee Konitz and Warren Marsh got together and played these things that were for the left hand and the right hand, and they would actually play them in public. And it's a great way of showing the intersection of a box notes and a jazz sound. Now, here, they're not improvising. They're playing them as written. But the sound of the saxophone, the inflections bring to it Louis Armstrong and Lester Young and Charlie Parker and Lee Konitz and Warren Marsh. So now we're really getting into the weeds here of uh, the hybridity of these two forms. <laughs> Lee Konitz and Warren Marsh. And now, if you'd like to, when you have time after this talk, go listen to the music of Lee Konitz and Warren Marsh, or any of the great jazz improvisers, and start to listen for things that you think might be Bach-related, which is when they start to play with the chords, and when they start to go into what seem to be runs and things like that. And all I can tell you is that if you were to write down the great majority of jazz improvisations, they would look very much like Bach's music. Not all of them, some are quite different, but many of them will look exactly like Bach's. And if I had students here today and I were to show on the board, written down Bach and written down Coleman Hawkins, because we're going to be talking about him specifically, I think 95% of them would raise their hand and say, are these things alike? 
or are they different? And you could switch them around. Kind of interesting concept to think about. Next, we go to a fascinating musician who uh, was able, like John Lewis and others, uh, to take the music of Bach and know how it went. They could play it perfectly as written and yet improvise with it and not lose the core essence of the Bach, right? You're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. And this is a brilliant guitarist named Django Reinhardt who came from Europe. He was what they called in those days a gypsy, Romani background. And in 1930, he heard a Louis Armstrong record and he had an epiphany. And he all of a sudden realized what jazz was and how he could unite his own music, his own culture's music, with the music of Louis Armstrong and African American culture. And he was also able to bring into it something equally remote in a certain kind of way, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. And, ma and make it acceptable, make it valid, make it happening, making it original, and yet containing all of those influences. And this is Django Reinhardt solo guitar uh, fooling around <laughs> with the music of Bach. I think Bach would have enjoyed it. Well, at least that piece started on the solo guitar, and then the rest of the quintet of the Hot Club of France came in uh, with Django Reinhardt. But the point was, uh, that took Bach. It didn't lose any of the Bachness of it, if you know what I mean, and it didn't lose any of the jazz of it, and it was really kind of a wonderful hybrid uh, performance there.
uh, showing what you can do with all those little byways that we talked about before of going from one chord to another chord. Uh, box music, when it's played by great musicians, uh, has a certain rhythmic essence to it. I would call it swing. Uh, and what does swing mean? Sometimes the word swing uh, is thought to be a particular style of jazz from a certain era. But what swing means to me, and I'll take my cue from Duke Ellington, he said, swing is something that encourages the terpiscorian urge. Now, terpiscorian sounds either like a, uh, you know, some early prehistoric animal or some condition that you have to go to the doctor for. But terpiscor was the god of dance, and what it means is that the music has some dance-like element to it, something that makes you want to pat your feet or shake your something or other and dance and move. It has a certain rhythmic flow to it. It encourages movement and the desire to dance. And music from every continent that we know of has that element. And uh, at one time, and to a great degree today, that was an essential element in, in jazz music. And Bach, go online, find something of Glenn Gould or some great pianist. There are so many great pianists playing uh, Bach, of course. Glenn Gould was the one who brought Bach to the forefront with his version of the Goldberg Variations in the 1950s. But listen to Bach played well, and I will tell you something, you will want to get up and dance. Now, someone who became very famous with a, jazz, with a dance band that also played great jazz was Benny Goodman. And his pianist was Teddy Wilson. And this is part of a talk for another time, but what's very important in the story of jazz, of course, is the story of America. And one cannot talk about the story of America without confronting the issue of race, as we know all too well as we're filming this video in 2022. It's still the great unresolved question of are we going to be able to come, uh, is America going to be able to come to terms with its legacy? Well, Benny Goodman integrated his band. In other words, he had African-American musicians, uh, playing with non-African American musicians at a time back in the 1930s when this was, and I use this German word uh, on purpose, verboten. But he did it, and it opened up uh, more opportunities uh, in this society for interracial groups. Well, Teddy Wilson, as much as he loved jazz, and he was a brilliant jazz pianist, at this time was studying classical music, playing Bach concerti, playing the harpsichord. He was a very young man. He was in his 20s at that time. And I'm going to share with you uh, something of uh, Teddy Wilson and Benny Goodman playing a duet where Teddy Wilson plays the harpsichord. And again, if you want to get into the land of imagination, I've been talking about closing your eyes and listening to the music and not thinking too much about it and just listening to it. I like to think that if Bach had come back to life and sat in with Benny Goodman, this is what it might have sounded like. Uh, this may be, uh, it's not a controversial statement, but a lot of jazz musicians, well actually just a lot of musicians in general feel that if Bach were to come back to life, and if he did, I'd probably head for the exit door, but seriously, if he did come back to life, uh, he would probably spend most of his time with the jazz musicians because in essence he was an improviser who also wrote music down. And improvisation has been bled out of what we call classical music. There are exceptions to the rule, of course there are, but for the most part it's been bled out, and I don't know what Bach would make of that. So, let's imagine Teddy Wilson slash Johann Sebastian Bach jamming with Benny Goodman on the radio in 1938. No one's ever heard this before. <laughs> 
a musician who was close at one point to Benny Goodman in the early days, and also to Teddy Wilson. They made records together, Goodman and Wilson, made records with Coleman Hawkins. And I wanted to kind of jump back to Coleman Hawkins right now because that's how we started the presentation. It's kind of how we're going to eventually end it, which is talking about the fact that Bach was something that was so intrinsically inspirational to Coleman Hawkins. I mean, Coleman Hawkins was born in 1904. He died in 1969. He virtually invented the jazz saxophone until he arrived at a saxophone in the 19-teens, the 1920s was almost like what an electric guitar was back in my day when I was growing up in the 1960s and 70s where every kid wanted to have one and you only had to know how to play a few things on it and you could play the electric guitar. Uh, in the same sense, the saxophone was really like that back in the 1920s. Kids wanted to play it. It was the, the instrument of the decade. And Coleman Hawkins took it from that status and turned it into something very much like Pablo Casals. And now I'll tell you something that we didn't talk about when we heard that original montage of Pablo Casals and Coleman Hawkins, because I didn't want to have this in your mind while you were listening to it. Coleman Hawkins took what was thought to be kind of a, a joke of an instrument, the saxophone, was not heard in symphony orchestras with a very few exceptions. And for people who didn't like jazz or didn't like African-American music, it had a lot of stuff thrown at it back in the 1920s, the sound of the saxophone. Coleman Hawkins had as, as a great inspiration, not only Johann Sebastian Bach, but some recordings that were made by Pablo Casals. In fact, the very piece that we heard at the beginning of the show here, or at, at the beginning of this lecture, uh, the solo cello suites of Bach. And Pablo Casals made a recording of those in the early 19, well, in the 1930s that really were the first recordings of Bach that uh, music for music's sake, it's not academic, it's not even orchestral, it's just somebody playing an instrument and weaving these wonderful dreamlike tapestries of harmony and sound. Coleman Hawkins had those records and he was in Europe in the 1930s. And we know now from letters that were written to him and uh, to him and that he wrote himself, that he carried in his bag as he went from country to country in the mid-1930s, these recordings of Pablo Casals playing the solo cello suites of Bach. And it became readily apparent in his music that he was doing on the saxophone what that music had done. Now here's a quote from Johann Sebastian Bach, and we're going to show it to you right now. And I'm well aware of the fact that there's nothing more deathly boring than someone reading something that's written in front of them. But nonetheless, here we go. Coleman Hawkins on Johann Sebastian Bach. I spend at least two hours a day listening to Johann Sebastian Bach, and man, it's all there. If they, meaning the young musicians of the early 1960s, want to learn how to improvise around the theme, which is the essence of jazz, adding the blue notes, which are the notes from the blues, they should learn from the master. He never wastes a note, and he knows where every note is going and when to bring it back. Some of these cats go way out and forget where they began or what they started to do. Bach will clear it all for them. Now this was written, or I should say this quote was made at a time late in Hawkins' career in the mid-1960s when he was able to play with Paul Blay and Eric Dolphy and Sonny Rollins and a little bit earlier John Coltrane and Thelonious Monk who actually Hawkins more than anyone else discovered and gave his very first recording date to. And I think that when the question was asked that got this response from uh, Coleman Hawkins, I think they probably thought he said, well, you know, I listen to all the young guys and I figure out what they're doing and get out my slide rule and tr try and figure out the mathematics of, co of contemporary music. No, he said, go back to Bach. And trust me, virtually everything that followed Coleman Hawkins' e example in the 1930s of great improvisation uh, has as much Bach in it as it has anything else. <laughs> 
What I'd like to do now is share with you, again, that montage that we heard at the beginning of this presentation, because now we've talked about it, you've heard some of the chords on the piano, you've heard other people take the influences of Bach and uh, in various kinds of music, and listen to it again. And the reason for listening to it again, uh, another favorite quote of mine, this one comes from Ernest Hemingway, there's no such thing as reading, there's only rereading. And what does that mean? That means that the first time that you read a book, or the first time that you hear a piece of music, or the first time that you watch a movie, or the first time that you drive somewhere that you haven't been to before, you are so consumed with trying to figure out what the story is, what the melody is, where to make the left turn off the highway, uh, all those things, that you really don't appreciate your surroundings and the actual story that's being told, or the actual music, or the actual scenery on the side of the road. The second time, when you do it the second time, that's when you begin to notice things. Just think about you're watching a film by, let's say, uh, Alfred Hitchcock, just for example. And it's a, one of those great murder mystery things, right? You watch it the first time, you're trying to figure out who did it, who's the, all this kind of stuff. The second time you watch it, you say, ah, the person at the end of the movie that we find out actually did the horrible thing, he's in the first scene of the film, but I didn't notice him because I didn't know that he was the one. And then every time you watch it, you discover more and more. Well, it's the same way with a great book, a great piece of music, a beautiful drive somewhere where you can actually enjoy the scenery as opposed to looking for the, the exit sign. And in that sense, I think that when we listen to this music now for the second time, you're going to hear a lot that you didn't hear in it the first time. And the music like this are the gifts that keep giving. I've been listening to these things for 50 years, believe it or not. And every time I listen to them, I hear something new. So I share this with you uh, with that intent. <laughs> ¶¶ 
we start to come to the culmination of this talk about Bach and jazz, we turn to a great moment uh, in American musical history, subcategory jazz, subcategory saxophone, and all that. It's Coleman Hawkins' record of Body and Soul from 1939. Now, some people like to say that jazz was America's popular music at one time. In my estimation, jazz was never America's popular music, but it was a, an element, a flavor, an essence, uh, an ingredient that from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, going into the 60s, was pretty present in a lot of popular music. And then it has slowly, slowly diminished since, although it remains there. Coleman Hawkins' record of Body and Soul is basically Coleman Hawkins doing a Bach on this song. Now I'd like to go to the piano and demonstrate to you exactly what I mean. If I were to play for you Body and Soul, the song that Coleman Hawkins plays on this famous recording, as it was originally written, it would be something kind of like this. would be the basic, basic chords like we talked about earlier in the presentation, those three chords out of which all this great music was spun for centuries. What Coleman Hawkins does is exactly what Bach does, which is to take one chord and on the way to the next chord, finding all these little tributaries, all these little byways, these little exits and entrances, still dealing with the basic chord. And they would be something like this. So here is a record that came out in 1939 on which Coleman Hawkins hardly plays the melody of the piece. He refers to it a little bit at the beginning and then he goes off into his Coleman Hawkins slash Bach improvisation and it's sold to the public at large. Really an amazing moment in American musical history. This is the complete 1939 recording of Body and Soul by Coleman Hawkins. <laughs> 
record uh, that kind of stunned some folks in the music business because if they had marketed this record as uh, here's an amazing moment of Bach-like ingenuity from a great improvising tenor saxophone player. Although it's above the heads of most of you, we're going to put this record out anyway, and hopefully you'll be hip enough and have large enough ears to enjoy it, but get ready because it's something really unusual. No, it wasn't presented like that. It was just presented like, here's some great music, listen to it. And guess what? The public did it. And what many people will tell you uh, is that if the public today was given the opportunity to hear more varied kinds of music. I hate to use the word sophisticated because the word sophisticated has within it all kinds of judgments and things like that. But I'll just say a broader array of harmonically generated, melodically beautiful music, uh, if there was just the slightest uh, degree of interest in doing that by the powers that be, that control the, uh, our musical world, the corporate world that, that controls it, Jazz, I think, would have definitely uh, a greater place. We're at the point now where, you know, uh, jazz music is not included in the Grammys. Uh, you know, they do it offline somewhere and then they refer to it or they show it for 10 or 15 minutes. It's one of America's great heritages. And it's a shame that America has not been able to get behind it, even with the Ken Burns documentary, even with Wynton Marsalis and Jazz at Lincoln Center and all the great things that have happened to keep jazz very much vital in America. Uh, that even with all of that, uh, it is not celebrated as a great American thing. Here in America, and I mean by uh, the people who spend money, disposable income for buying things, let's put it that way. It's one thing what happens in the concert halls and what happens in institutions of higher learning and the conservatories and the very small amount of people who identify themselves as jazz lovers these days. Uh, but in the way that box music is so much a part of, of Germany and Europe's mu musical history, and it's still heard all over the place. I wish that jazz kind of had that presence here in America, but nonetheless, we're doing the good work here of showing the connections between these various things. Now, we just heard Body and Soul, and what we're going to listen to now is something uh, kind of like science fiction, where I took Coleman Hawkins's melodies that he improvised, and I layer them on top of each other. It's not technically perfect, you know what I mean? I tried to line it up as best as I could in my homemade technical stuff here. But nonetheless, you're going to hear first just one, two parts against each other, then three parts, four parts, five parts, and six parts. It's gonna sound a little bit jumbled, but at the root of it, I think you'll hear not only the essence, the genius of Coleman Hawkins, but also that Bach-like counterpoint and complexity. So, here we go with this experiment. 
sense. I don't know what his, <laughs> what his reaction to that would be, uh, but we took that original 1939 recording and just kind of A and B'd it against itself, two parts, then three, then four, then five, then six, and although it was jumbled, uh, nonetheless, you could clearly hear uh, the influence that that kind of Bach-like counterpoint and melody and ways of getting around the chords that, that I demonstrated before were so much a part of Coleman Hawkins. It's been wonderful having the opportunity to talk to you about uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, Coleman Hawkins, jazz, and we also touched pretty broadly uh, around the whole issues of music, jazz, classical, European influences, American influences, corporate interests. So we kind of ranged far and wide, but I think that's appropriate because Bach's music and Coleman Hawkins' music are each musical universes that contain multitudes. And the more you get into them, going back to that comment about reading and rereading, re-listening, the more that you re-listen to Bach, the more that you re-listen to Coleman Hawkins and all the people who came from them, the more you'll get out of it, the more you'll understand the relationships and start to listen and look for the things that unite these things that are usually thought to be diametrically opposed, composition, improvisation, the music of jazz musicians, the music of European composers from hundreds of years ago, and see that they're all really aiming after something which is uh, being coherent. I hope I've been kind of coherent in this presentation. It's been a lot of fun spending time with you, and uh, enjoy the music of Bach and Coleman Hawkins.